This is Robert Sanjetis coming to you once again into your living room, office, den, lounge area, conservatory, library, whatever you find comfortable to be in with your computer and you want to participate in our program called the Open Question Program for October 3rd, 2019. I am the host of your program, and I will take your questions, comments, opinions, objections, whatever, regarding things basically dealing with science, uh, whatever science uh, you would like to talk about, but we deal specifically or especially in the areas of cosmology, cosmogony, <clears throat> Creation versus evolution, geocentrism versus heliocentrism, um, you know, Big Bang versus creation, all those kinds of things. And we also deal with issues related to that, like paleontology or radiometry, things of that nature. And uh, I'll endeavor to give you the Catholic perspective on those, at least the official position. And I'll let you know what else may be going on behind the scenes, so to speak. So um, <clears throat> I want to advertise a few things as I try to each week here for those that are not familiar with the principal and our website and our movie and all those things that we've been doing for the last, well, five or so years, uh, we have an office in Hollywood, Stellar Motion Pictures, LLC, and that was the institution that produced our movie, The Principal, which came out in theaters in October this month, as a matter of fact, uh, in 2014, five years ago. Uh, seen in theaters around the country, and we have also from that movie our DVD of the principal. Let me get that for you. That is right here the principal. For those of you who haven't had a chance to see the movie or see the DVD, it's still on sale. Uh, $14.95, uh, foreign and domestic, and we also have streaming and downloading available on, you know, your favorite, what, Hulu and all those kinds of uh, outfits now that stream and download. So there it is for you, the principle of the universe is trying to tell us something. And um, <clears throat> you'll find out what it's trying to tell us. Of course, in the hour and a half, 90 minutes that you view the movie, and basically it tells us that the Earth is in the center of the universe. Yes, you heard it here first, folks, and we say that without any shame, embarrassment, or recapitulation, or anything of that sort. It is the God's honest truth. Yes, and you'll find out that the Famous scientists in the world today have already admitted it, and at least some of them have. And uh, there we go. Okay, and our other movie called Journey to the Center of the Universe. I'm trying to get the glare out of here for you. Journey to the Center of the Universe. Uh, this is a four and a half hour documentary uh, produced, written, directed by yours truly. And um, four and a half hours of the best science that you'll ever lay your eyes on, guaranteed, because there's nothing like it in the world today. Uh, one of the first videos of its kind ever made. And this one is a two disc set. And so the price is a little higher at $29.95. And if you go to our principal website, principalmovie.com, uh, you can get a package deal, a uh, journey to center of the universe with the principal DVD 
for a discount. And we will also be having a discount come Christmas. And my director is working on that right now. So I will make that available to you. And um, what did I do with it? Here it is. All right. I want to plug this book that I wrote a few months ago. It was published called Geocentrism for Dumpskies and Smart Kids. Um, full color inside. All the pictures are color. Uh, what, about 250 pages or so. Uh, easy reading, like on the fourth, you know, fourth or fifth grade level, uh, Reader's Digest level, so to speak, uh, available for you for a price, what, I think it's $19.95, uh, which is pretty good for a color, uh, color photo book in paperback. Okay, so, uh, or maybe it's $29.95, I think, yeah. We do have a hardback edition of this book, which is a little expensive, sixty-four ninety-five. Uh, you know, I am at the mercy of my printers for this, so that's we have to make the price that because any lower, we'd probably lose money on it. But that is available if someone wants that book, and these um, are available. I I think Lawrence is putting this up soon. If he if he hasn't already, he better. Uh, on our robertsongenis.com website. So that'll be available for you, okay? And we have a lot of other books, of course, but um, I don't want to take up too much time. Uh, we have one question in the box here. So it looks like people either coming late or they're not coming, one or the other. If so, I'll end the program early. And uh, we'll just wait till next week. <clears throat> so we have um, Ben here is again. Kate is here. Alex is here. And Jose is here. Okay. It looks like other people are doing other things tonight. So we will uh, take it as they come. All right. So Ben says, hello, Robert. How does a quantum computer work and why it is... And why is it supposed to be so much faster than a regular computer? Do you think that there will one day be widespread ownership of quantum computers in the public in the way there is now widespread ownership of personal computers? You know, Ben, uh, I really don't know. I used to know the answer to this question, and I forgot it because I don't deal that much in computers. I read a few things about quantum computers a while ago, but uh, darned if I remember what I read. So I'm sorry. Sorry out of luck here for you. And since you're the only question, <laughs> okay, here comes another question. A couple more. Yeah, I'm sorry I can't help you there, Ben. You probably do better on the uh, internet looking up quantum computers, checking it out. I, I have no expertise in that area whatsoever, okay? So, um, Preben says, hello, Robert. Is human evolution and millions of years a heresy? Uh, well, when you use the word heresy, yeah, you're talking about um, something uh, theologically, um, with, with a theological background to the question were religious because um, religious institutions are the ones that will designate something a heresy. Uh, now, you might say that science being its own religion also has its own, you know, quote unquote heretics, okay? And those are the scientists that don't go along with the mainstream. That's the word they use, the mainstream. Um, and they're called dissident scientists. But, you know, that's in the science field. In the, and if it was a religious field, they would be called heretics. <laughs> okay, so. And science today um, is, is like a religion. And the religion that, the, the, the word that's been coined 
for them is, or for it, is scientism. Scientism, okay? And I'm glad that um, people, uh, the critics around the world, are beginning to realize this, that science is not some kind of, and this is the image they try to create for themselves, that they are purely objective when it comes to interpreting the data that they get from their telescopes and microscopes and even their quantum computers. And that is just a big fat lie, okay? Sometimes scientists are no more objective than a used car salesman. And I mean that sincerely. Uh, they have a certain mold that you must fit into. And if you dare deviate from that mold, you will get fired. And it will be a hard job for you to find another job. Um, you know, in this case of evolution, for example, um, this professor, uh, or the, I guess he was a professor, but he also worked for the Smithsonian Institution down here in Washington, D.C., where I, I live near Washington. Uh, von Stenberg was his name. And um, <clears throat> he had the audacity to start speaking about, not creationism per se, but intelligent design. This was like about, I don't know, less than 10 years ago. Okay. And he just made the suggestion in one of his articles that it appears that that our world of organic beings and animals and plants is so complex, each one is so complex, that it appears that there would be required a designer to put this all together. I mean, after all, now he didn't use this analogy, but after all, I'm saying after all, um, we know from trial and error that if you have all the parts to a watch and you place them in a room and you kept shaking it and hoping that all the watch parts would somehow fit together to make a watch, we all know intrinsically that that is an absurd proposition. That you could shake that watch for a trillion, zillion, gigabillion, years and you would never get a watch okay never zero zilch nada possibility of getting a watch out of that and yet the human organism is so much more complex than a watch that it just stands to reason that somewhere somehow some way someone in the secular uh uh institutions and of academia are going to realize or someone's going to stand up and say you know guys all we're working on about this evolution it just ain't going to work it just ain't going to work okay and that's what von stenberg did but in a very subtle way just like one or two sentences in this article he, he said this just like it was off the cuff, you know, not like he was trying to make a big deal about it, but just set it off the cuff and the whistleblowers came in by the truckload and had this guy brought before whoever was in charge down there, the Smithsonian, and forthwith had him resign his post. And he fought it a little bit and um, they wouldn't give in, you see. For, because to them, this is a test case. Because if von Stenberg could pass muster and escape the witch, witch hunt trial that the Smithsonian Institution was perpetrating on him, well, then there would be somebody else come along who would be even more bold or bolder than von Stenberg and start going a little bit beyond intelligent design. And even mentioning that word that we're so afraid to mention, 
God. God. Yes. Oh, my gosh. If there was ever a three-letter word that's anathema to science, it's the word God. Yes. I mean, we went over that uh, quote from Richard Lewinton, a uh, professor of biology at Harvard, still teaching there, okay, still, still declaring the same gospel of evolution. And he basically said the same thing von Stenberg said. And, and he probably even more direct, okay, more pertinent than what von Stenberg said, because von Stenberg's uh, comment was just off the cuff, basically. But here was Lewinton saying, look, we know that evolution doesn't work. Okay? We know that all our theories amount to basically nothing as the reason why we could have evolution. But he said, we still accept it as the only viable theory for why we are here because the only other alternative is to believe that God exists and he created it and we can't let a divine foot in the door. Does that say it all? I mean, you got to give Lewinton credit for basically telling it like it is laying it on the line, you know, and I appreciate it for his honesty, all right, um, but that's the state of affairs, okay, so yeah, if you go, as you can see, it's no holds barred for these people, nothing will tear them away from their evolution, you could come up with the most sophisticated argument, against evolution and they will look at you like you know you're cross-eyed because they're not going to listen to you okay why is that because it's a religion to them okay it's a religion their god is evolution and that's what they believe in small g god evolution and that's what they worship that's what gives them their paycheck that's what gives them their prestige, their fame, their fortune, okay? That's what allows them to write articles in magazines with PhD behind their name and to appear on television and in sometimes in movies and on the Science Channel and on the Discovery Channel. And, you know, they can, they can uh, be adulated by all their companions and, and compatriots and think they're really doing well, okay? That's what they worship. That's the God that they want to serve because it gives them everything they want in this world, okay? So they're not going to let go of that, even if, as Lewinton says, they have no idea how evolution occurs, okay? So, yeah, it's a religion, and what happens to those quote-unquote dissidents who raise an objection like von Stenberg? Well, that's heresy okay. in the Church of Scientism. That's heresy. How dare you, you know, give a logical argument against evolution? <laughs> All right, so that's what we're up against. And then if you try to come to them with the church, and, you know, the church says, like in Lateran Council 4 or Vatican Council 1, some of our strongest statements about creationism, leaving alone the fathers for the time being, they look at you like you're cross-eyed. You know, there is no authority greater than science is the way they see it. Or, or our God is greater than your God so to speak. You know, we always read those stories in the Old Testament, you know, where like the Philistines come up and to the Israelites and say, our God is greater than your God. Our God can beat up your God, you know, or like Elijah at Mount Carmel with the 400 false prophets of Baal. And uh, 
you know, they, they challenge Elijah and says, our gods can beat your God, the God of Israel. And, and so Elijah says, let's have a test, you know, and he, he creates this uh, a little arena with uh, wood. And he says, go bring all the wood from the forest and put it in a pile here. And he says, I want you to call on your God. Ekron, I think, was his name. Uh, and, uh, you know, have him start a fire right here on this wood. Call it down from heaven. So the prophets of Baal, 450 of them, are screaming and wailing and carrying it on and doing all their dances and jigs and blah, 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 uh, pleading with their God to come down and start a fire on this heap of wood. And, and Elijah, you know, and he, this is why it's good to know the Hebrew, because Elijah says to them, hmm, maybe your God is out taking a piss. <laughs> That's what it says in the Hebrew. Okay. Maybe he's occupied somewhere. Did you dial the right number? You know, stuff like that. He's just taunting them. And, uh, of course, you know, you can imagine what their disposition is when he's saying this stuff to them. And then he says, now step aside and watch. And he calls down God Almighty. But first, what Elijah does, he says, now, what I want you to do before I call my God is I want you to put water on all this wood. Douse it as best you can. Flood it. Okay? Make sure there's no matchstick worth of wood that hasn't been soaked in water. Okay? And so they do that. Pour water all over it. And then Elijah calls down God from heaven. And this big ball of flame comes down and devours not only the wood, but all the false prophets. Okay? So there you have it. That's our God. Okay, so uh, in a sense, you know, the evolutionists have got into a quote unquote pissing contest with us and our God. Okay, and it's whose God's going to win. Now, of course, you know, because God doesn't throw down bolts of lightning from heaven today, like he did with Elijah, you know, they think they're winning. And perhaps they are, you know. Well, there's an old saying, you know, you can win the battle, but lose the war. They will lose the war. Okay, that will be a certainty. But they will win the battle, and they're winning it today. And that's why even in Catholicism today, I'd say 90% of Catholics believe in evolution. Yep, 90% or more. Okay. And that's because the scientists have won the battle with their fame, fortune, prestige, everything, and intimidating people who don't know big fancy equations and can't use nomenclature that is only for the sophisticated elite scientists to use. Well, see, you're just ignorant, okay? And uh, that's what we're up against. So I'm sorry to go on a little tangent there, uh, Preben, but uh, that is absolutely necessary. The key word that you used there was heresy. Okay, so I wanted to make that relevant to all parties involved. Okay, all right, so let's see what we got. What else we have here? Uh, Victor says, as far as I know, we have writings and documents from ancient civilizations like Sumer and Egypt that shows that the earth couldn't be 6,000 years old. Does the Bible teach the earth is 6,000 years old? If it does, I'd obviously believe the Bible over anything else. How old do you think the earth is? Um, yeah, I believe the earth is between six and 7,000 years old. All right, and I say that without any shame, any reservation. Uh, I've studied the science, and the science fits right into that chronology, okay? You can talk about radiometry, you can talk about the Big Bang, you can talk about paleontology, uh, archaeology, whatever ologies you want to talk about. 
there's nothing that has been found that discredits the six to 7,000 years that the earth, that the universe has been here, okay? And as a matter of fact, all the evidence that we found points to a young earth. I just got a letter, an email from a friend of mine who is in his 80s, and he's been a paleontologist for most of his life. And he is he does digs in places all over the United States. And he sent me a picture of uh, a human footprint with a dinosaur footprint right alongside of it. Okay. And he does this all the time, sends them to me. And right, I can't argue with him. And I know he's an honest man. He's not manufacturing these things. Uh, he's a good Catholic Christian. Okay. He just sent me one uh, yesterday of a human footprint that was 16 inches long. <laughs> That's pretty big. Uh, in one of their digs. Okay. So he has all the evidence. All right. Now, what are the evolutionists telling us? Well, they're, they're saying that there's no dinosaur that could possibly exist with man. First of all, the dinosaurs are uh, from the age of uh, 65 million years ago. Okay. And humans just arrived on the scene 200,000 years ago. All right. So what? What is that? Um, like one five hundredth of the time we've been here compared to the dinosaurs. So they tell us. Okay. Well, then what the heck is this guy's evidence showing you? But see, they just ignore it. Whatever doesn't agree with their theory, they just ignore. And you know today it's all about publicity. Who can get on TV? Who can get on the radio? Who can get in the magazines? And if you can't get your stuff in the magazines because all of these ways of communication have the gatekeepers, the only ones that we could possibly get to now are like YouTube uh, and things like that, even they're being censored. So far, they haven't censored creationist material, okay? But that's it. But who goes to YouTube compared to the millions of people that watch television uh, uh, or um, other outlets, movies or magazines, stuff like that. I mean, you know, we're still controlled by that. And, you know, YouTube might be making inroads, but only with special things, you know, like, you know, somebody has a million views, two million views, but what is it? Well, it's some oddity, you know, some circus sideline that, you know, we, we don't see every day and happens to get everybody's attention. And we go, oh, uh, isn't that cute and all that stuff, okay? But there isn't any creationist outlet that's getting a million views because people have already been trained to turn it off, all right? But this stuff exists. So that's why I can say that the Earth is six to 7,000 years old because I can't sit there and look at a dinosaur print next to a human footprint and say, well, it just doesn't exist. He made it up somehow, blah, blah, blah. I can't do that. I see the evidence in front of me, okay? I mean, just what? It was ten, oh, nine years ago, and I think I covered this once before on this program, where Mary Schweitzer, um, who worked for some university in, where was it? Colorado? I'm not positive. Uh, was doing a dig, paleontologist doing a dig, and she came across a big bone. They figured out that it was a femur from a Tyrannosaurus rex, and they had to, they were trying to, they were digging all the dirt out around it, and they were trying to basically get a chain around the middle of the bone with a crane to pull it out because it was that heavy. And as they put the chain on the crane and tried to pull it out, it snapped in two. All right. So that forced them basically to go in and examine it. And you know what they found? They found blood vessels, collagen, 
uh, blood cells, all kinds of organic specimens like that, that they found in it. Now, you and I both know that an organic specimen, no matter how well it's preserved, is not going to last 65 million years. Okay. It just, it just isn't. It would be lucky to last a thousand years. Okay. Especially exposed as it is, you know, even though it's covered by dirt, there's still oxygen down there. There's still microorganisms down there. Uh, and bones don't last forever. Okay. You know, a lot of them last a long time, but not forever. Uh, they're the last things to go, of course, but still, if you break the bone open and you find organic tissue, I mean, what more evidence do you need? I mean, think about it. There's nothing else that can be given to you if you don't accept this as prima facie evidence that your theory is shot to hell. Your theory that it occurred 65 million years ago. So what happens? Mary uh, uh, tells her boss, his name is Jack Horner, believe it or not. <laughs> Little Jack Horner sat in his corner eating his evolution. He pulled out his plum and said, what a good atheistic evolutionist I am. And that's exactly what happened. Mary told him, and Jack says to her, verbatim, and I wrote an article about this, and I quoted him on it. He says, Mary, what are you, do what are you going to do with this? Which is going to be your conclusion? And she said, well, somehow uh, the, the uh, specimen was preserved. I don't know how it could be preserved, but it was preserved for 65 million years. And Jack says to her, make sure you do that. Something to that effect. Make sure you do that. In other words, Mary, if you don't do that, guess what? You're going to be in the unemployment line. Because I'll fire you as soon as look at you. Okay? That was behind what he was saying. Why? Well, because Jack's part of the institution. He's part of the whole framework. All right, he's just like Richard Lewinton from Harvard, who will believe in evolution even though he knows it's absurd. And Jack, when faced with the evidence, will totally deny that his evolution could even possibly be wrong. Okay, so again, we have evidence for it. And I could go on and on and on with you about why it's okay to believe that the Bible, when it says the earth is, or the universe itself, is six to 7,000 years old. Okay? So, uh, why would we come to that figure in the first place? Why not 10,000 years? Why not 20,000 years? Okay? Well, because we have these things called genealogies in Genesis chapter 5 and Genesis chapter 11. And they are very precise. And it says, so-and-so begat so-and-so. And when so-and-so was so many years old, uh, he had a uh, son. And his name was, you know, Jack. And it goes this, gives the same formula, you know, all the way through for about, what, you know, 15 different names. Okay? Then it does it again after the flood. In Genesis 11, gives us a whole set of names. How long they lived before they had the son, how long they lived after they had the son, and uh, how old the son was. Okay? And so if, if we follow this genealogy, and we have a good starting date from which to backtrack, all right, and we do have a good starting date. And that date is 931 BC, and we choose that date because it's the it's the division of the Israelite monarchy into two kingdoms. 
one in the north with 10 tribes and two in the south. And that date was 931. We are almost crystal clear positive about that date. Okay. So we, and the Bible gives us time clues. Like there's 480 years from uh, the division of the monarchy back uh, to uh, a certain time in Egypt. And, and then it gives us other time clues to make this bridge. And it's amazing that the Bible gives us these time bridges. I mean, who would have thought about that, you know, uh, at that time when you're ready? You know, who cares about a time bridge that's over 500 years? But they put them in there. And so we know how to connect the 931 date with the genealogies that I just mentioned in Genesis 5 and 11. Okay. And we know also that by this, the particular Hebrew words that are used, you know, we, we often hear uh, so-and-so begot so-and-so, you know, the begots. Sometimes we, people, critics make fun of the Bible by saying, oh, it has all these begots there. And I, I got to the begots and I just put down the Bible because it got so boring. But they don't realize what they're doing. They haven't a clue. Because if they understood what the begots meant, they would understand that this is a calendar. This is a calendar of history. And that's why it's there. And you can trace the beginning of the whole universe and human civilization if you understand the begots of the Bible. Because they take you right back to the beginning. And the word begot in Hebrew is yalad. And it only has one meaning. One, father-son relationship. Not grandfather, grandson, not great grandfather, great grandson, father, son. So when it says Adam begot Seth, we know that Seth was the immediate son of Adam. You know, when it says Lamech begot Noah, we know that Noah was the immediate son of Lamech. Okay? That's how precise the Bible is. So if you put that all together, what do you come out with? Okay, you come out with possibly uh, six to seven thousand years at the most. Okay, and it can actually be more precise than that. There is an actual date you can arrive. Now, the only difficulty there is you have three different texts to read from. Okay, uh, first of all, you have the original Hebrew that the text was written in. But the, the latest extant copy of the original Hebrew comes from the Masoretes, okay, in the ninth century AD. Now we have bits and pieces of it, but the complete text is uh, from the Masoretes. Now we trust them, okay, they're pretty accurate. Um, so that's one source we have. Then we have the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the original Hebrew. All right. Now, since we don't have the original Hebrew any longer, we only have the Masoretic text. And they copied from an, uh, a, a source of Hebrew that doesn't exist anymore. Okay. So the Septuagint version, or the what they call the LXX, was a translation of the original Hebrew that no longer exists. So we have to sort of decipher from the Septuagint because it's not inspired by God, okay? So it could be an error. We have to use that text because it's a scholarly text, even though it's a translation, and we have to decipher from that, you know, the correct text of what the original Hebrew Bible was. At least we try to, okay? And then a third source is the Samaritan Pentateuch. The Pentateuch is the first five books of the Bible, okay, that was, uh, that was written in Samaria, all right? And that wasn't inspired either, okay? Only the Hebrew original was inspired. And <coughs> we have to look at that, too, because that's a scholarly text. It's an ancient text that has to be consulted before we arrive at a conclusion. Now, it just so happens that there's some discrepancies between those three texts. 
okay? And one of them is in Genesis 11, verses 11 and 12. The Septuagint version um, has this guy named Canaan coming after Selah, and the Masoretic text does not have Canaan in there, okay? And, you know, we're talking about, at Genesis 11, we're talking about a couple hundred years here. Uh, actually, it's 400. That would make a difference in what final date we come to for the creation of Adam. Okay? Depending on what text you're going to use. So the Septuagint text would have a longer period of time, and the Masoretic text would have a shorter. Okay? And it just so happens that in Luke 3.36, uh, Canaan's name is mentioned in Luke's genealogy. Okay? Now here's another thing we have to deal with. Not all texts, okay, and some of the famous papyri, uh, P, what is it? Um, uh, P66, yeah, that's a famous uh, papyri. P66 doesn't have Canaan's name. And papyri are earlier than the vellum Greek manuscripts, and so this carries a lot of weight. And then we have Codex D uh, agreeing with papyri 66 because it doesn't have uh, Canaan's name in Luke's genealogy, okay? So something is amiss here, all right? And so the question would be, is the Septuagint reliable in Genesis 11, verses 11 and 12, when it puts Canaan after Selah? All right? So at any rate, those are the only problems we have, okay? So it's not picture perfect, but it's pretty near there. But it certainly isn't going to give us 65 million years. No matter how you, <laughs> how you add up those discrepancies, the, the most discrepancy you're going to have is like maybe 400 years, and that's it. That's the most you're going to squeeze out of the textual variants that are addressing this issue. Okay? So, uh, you know, it's pretty much a solid case that the Bible is saying there's six to 7,000 years for the existence of the universe itself. Okay? Uh, so, now I went all through that just to show you how, you know, studying the Bible, you can arrive at that date. So, we don't arrive at 10,000 we don't uh, BC or 20,000 BC or 30,000, okay? No. Now, some Christians try to do that. You know, they try to say, well, you know, the, the, the genealogies in Genesis 5 and 11, they're not exact. Uh, you know, we, we can put extra years in between the progenitors and their sons and blah, blah, blah. Uh, no, you can't because the Hebrew Yalad will not let you do that. If you want to change the Hebrew language, you know, you can go ahead, but it's not what the original Hebrews believed and wrote down. You know, if they wanted to have gaps of thousands of years between these uh, uh, fathers of, of the genealogies, they could have done that. They could have picked a Hebrew word that was ambiguous, but they didn't, okay? So uh, it won't allow them to do that, but they try to do it nevertheless, uh, at least to try to coincide with carbon-14 evidence that says that, you know, these dinosaurs occurred, you know, 20 to 30,000 B.C. Uh, no, it's not the Bible that's wrong. It's the carbon-14 that needs to be updated or the theory of how you arrive at the half-life of carbon-14 needs to be better understood. As a matter of fact, if you had a cataclysm like Noah's flood, that's going to change the decay rate of carbon-14. Anytime you introduce a, an external factor like that, the decay rate's going to change. Okay, So that's what they have to deal with on that side. But again, you know, we're nowhere near 65 million years, all right? So uh, there's your answer, okay? Is it, what, is it Victor? There's your answer, Victor, okay? Uh, now, you say in here, writings and documents from ancient civilizations like Sumer and Egypt 
that show the earth couldn't be 6,000 years. I don't know what documents you're talking about. Okay. Um, if you have a document that you, that it's, you know, says the earth can't be that young, uh, we need to produce it. Okay. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, those, um, ancient documents, as far as I know, um, they just throw figures here and there. There's no chronology. There's no genealogies in those ancient documents. They just throw out figures. Uh, you know, so-and-so God appeared blank, blank, blank years ago without any rhyme or reason to where they're getting this from. Okay. And so it's haphazard to say the least. Uh, all their figures about who is this old or who is that old. The Bible, you don't have it that way. Everything in the Bible is like a chain link fence. You, it's so interconnected. Okay, you you have a um, you don't have a chronology unless you have a genealogy. Basically, that's the way they kept time back then. That's how they know how the years were progressing. They based it all on the progenitor at that time. Like, say, right now, we say 2019, Anno Domine, okay? That's 2019, the year of our Lord. So what are we doing? We're basing our calendar on the historical figure, Jesus Christ, that came at a specific point in history, okay? And we can get to that date very easily by looking at the Roman calendar. Uh, there's actually four different calendars we can use, but the uh, the uh, Olympiad calendar uh, used by the Romans was very accurate, okay? And you could actually use the Olympiad Roman calendar to get right to the birth of Jesus, okay? I mean, it's that accurate. And so that that calendar was used by the Romans before Jesus came, all right? Uh, but now we say B.C., or b before Christ. Of course, they didn't use that back, you know, before Jesus came. All right? We just use it now because he's, you know, the great uh, demarcation in history for us. Um, but back in, you know, Seth's time, you know, they would say, uh, somebody say, what year is it? And somebody would say, well, it's Seth uh, 340. Okay, because why? Because Seth was the calendar marker for that time period. All right, and you know, or you could do it with any uh, Methuselah. Now he lived to be nine hundred sixty-nine years old. So, what year is it, Methuselah? Well, it's um, you know nine hundred and forty-three, Methuselah. That's how they knew the, what time, what, what uh, date they were in history. Okay. So, yeah, all these things hang together. You don't find that in ancient literature at all, okay? Um, if they did have any semblance of it, they were copying the Hebrews. And this is the big secret. You know, all these secular anthropologists and paleontologists, they all try to say that the Hebrews copied from the Mesopotamians. Uh, no, it's the other way around, actually, okay? The uh, latest uh, version of um, Enumo Elish, which was written by the Mesopotamians, is like 1200 A.D. Okay, so um, that's no proof, of course, that, you know, they came before the Hebrews. If the latest manuscript we have of them, I'm sorry, I said 12 A.D., I'm, I mean 1200 B.C., okay, that's the latest manuscript we have. So how can you say that the Mesopotamians came before the Hebrews and the Hebrews copied from them if you don't have the literature to prove it, okay? So there they have problems as well. You know, I can go on and on about this, all right? I've been studying this stuff for 45 years, and nothing I've come across yet has been able to deter me from the biblical record of six to 7,000 years, okay? So... All right, Larry says, how does a geocentric worldview solve the dark matter and dark energy issues? Oh, good question, Larry. All right, we got about eight minutes left. 
All right, so what, what, what we need to do is we'll need to explain uh, the origin of dark matter and dark energy, okay? First of all, this is an invention, okay? It's an invention by the Big Bang theorists to patch up all the holes that are in the Big Bang theory that they have discovered over the years, okay? So right off the bat, I'm just going to tell you up front, it's just a bunch of malarkey, all right? Now, what made them, or what forced them to invent this dark matter and dark energy? Okay, so you have to go back to the Big Bang, all right? So there's this big explosion, and this explosion had problems right at the beginning because if it's exploding and all this matter and energy is coming out, um, and, and the radii becomes, uh, is increasing, therefore the distance between part A and part B is going to increase exponentially, okay? How is A going to communicate with B, you know? Because if you, if you um, have the speed of light, that's limited to 186,000 miles per second. And you have point A and point B of this exploding universe that is a million times more distant than 186,000 miles. Okay, how, how are they gonna communicate? They're not, okay? And that causes a problem. Well, because if they're not going to communicate, the right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing, and so they can't have an isotropic explosion. But that's what's required for the Big Bang, to have an isotropic explosion, where everything's equilateral all throughout the universe. There's no part of the universe that's going to have a, a sizable a uh, portion of mass and energy over against another portion, you see. It's all going to be equilateral, isotropic throughout the universe. Because why? This is what's driving them. There can be no special place in the universe. Okay? No special place. Because if a certain place did have more energy and matter proportionally, you know, let's say not one place had 90% of the matter, and all the rest of the universe had just 10%, well, that 90% would be the special place, you see. You could tell the difference between that place and the place over here that only has 10% spread out everywhere, okay? So this is the byline for the Big Bang explosion. It has to be isotropic, okay? All right, so that's one thing. But you got this problem with the speed of light and the speed of gravity, because Einstein told them that gravity goes the speed of light. So gravity can only go 186,000 miles a second. So that's another problem. If, you, if they can't have gravitational interaction between one another, then, you know, one of these things with greater mass and energy might go off, you know, 10 times faster than this part that doesn't have that much energy. Okay, so you won't have an isotropic explosion. All right, so how do you get out of that? Well, somebody from MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology named Alan Guth, had a dream one night. Not literally, but he had a dream and he said, I know how to get out of this problem. We'll just say it exploded so fast at such a distance that nothing could stop it. And this like created a mold, like a jello mold for the universe so that I could properly be isotropic at the same time that it exploded because it happened so fast and covered such a great distance. It exploded to 10 to the 35th times as much as it was in the beginning. And it did so in 10 to the minus 35 seconds. 
In other words, they're, what they're trying to do is like the hand is quicker than the eye. Okay. So basically they're trying to make the theory go so fast that you can't even comprehend it in your mind. And therefore you don't know what's happening. Just like a magician. All right. And did they have any evidence or proof for this? Not a whistle. It was just something they needed to keep the Big Bang Theory going. All right. And what it's the name that they apply to it is inflation. Obviously, because, you know, it's inflating so fast. And there you have it. And since they had nothing better, everybody accepted Guth's idea. Inflation. It must be inflation. And everybody was just praising it. Oh, why didn't I think about that? Yeah. You know, this is how science is done today. All right? Not the least bit of evidence for it. As a matter of fact, everything goes against it. But since Einstein had already boxed them in their cage, you know, somebody had to think of something. You know, it, it, but actually it's curious. I'll get to dark matter and dark energy in a minute. Okay, I just want to build the stage here. And it's curious, you know, now that they still think the universe is expanding, okay, um, they say that it's expanding faster than the speed of light. Really? How did that happen? I mean, the reason you invented inflation in the beginning was to take care of the limited speed of light that Einstein gave you from the special theory of relativity and the limitation on the speed of gravity. So what, what changed in order for you to say now that something can go faster than the speed of light? The universe itself can expand faster than the speed of light, you see, because they got caught with their pants down. All right. Somebody discovered the candlesticks that they use, the supernovas that they use, uh, were dictating to them that the universe wasn't expanding at, you know, just a nominal rate. It was actually accelerating at a superluminal rate. Well, if that's what the candlesticks show us, you know, can't argue with them. So we'll just say, it. but, you know. Nobody's saying, well, gee, doesn't that contradict Einstein's theory that says light can only go 186,000 miles a second? Well, you know, uh, we just have, well, some honest scientists will tell you why they've adopted this, but they haven't gotten themselves out of the hole. They'll say, well, you know, Einstein's general relativity said that anything can go faster than the speed of light. Even the speed of light can go faster than the speed of light. <laughs> what I mean by that is the speed of light in, the ge in general relativity can go faster than the speed of light in special relativity. Okay? And that all depends on the, the gravity and the inertial forces that light it confronts as it travels. Because special relativity didn't deal with gravity and inertial forces. And that's why Einstein could put a speed limit on it okay but you can't do that in general relativity so the honest scientists will say well the reason we can make the universe go faster than the speed of light is because general relativity allows us to do it it's at least three to four times faster than a special relativity speed of light okay well then why didn't you use that in the beginning uh for the big bang and and instead you invented this thing called inflation well, nobody thought about it then, you know. But we just didn't apply it right. All right. But you got contradictions all over the place. That's the problem, okay? You got one part of the universe going slow, and now you have to fix it by making it super fast. And then you have the other part of the universe going really fast. And so you have to change theories now to try to explain that, okay? So... I needed to, to get on, get in that uh, whole scenario there because this leads directly to dark matter and dark energy, okay? So when they saw, in 1998, when they saw that these supernovas, the, the candlesticks they used to measure the universe, speed and distance, were saying that the universe was accelerating, well, they had to ramp up the speed of the universe expanding, okay? 
uh, you know, way beyond the Hubble constant. I mean, that's not a constant anymore. I mean, it's just way beyond that. All right. They had to change the Hubble constant three times before they saw the 1998 evidence of the supernovas. And now the universe is just accelerating, you know, at, you know, superluminal speeds that Hubble never envisioned. So uh, the question is, where do you get all the energy for this? Okay. I mean, there is, there is a certain residual energy of inertia that will occur if you have a explosion and that inertia will, will keep expanding the explosion but eventually that inertia will dissipate and the, the universe will slow down as the farther it goes out okay and some even say you know it could come back together all right but so the inertia is making it go out but it's going to slow down and it's certainly not accelerating if it's slowing down, is it? Okay. But if you're saying that the universe is accelerating in its expansion, well, acceleration takes force. Force requires energy. And so where are you going to get the energy to allow this universe to expand at superluminal speeds? What do you think? Yeah, someone else had a dream. And he said, I know what we'll do. We'll just say it's out there, this energy. We haven't discovered it. We have no evidence for it. But we need it to patch up the Big Bang Theory. And so we'll just call it dark energy. Okay. Why? Because they need it to be the fuel for this accelerating universe. Okay. So that's where that comes from. And... They need it so bad that they say that about 70 to 75% of the universe is composed of dark energy of which we've never seen. Okay? That's a lot. So we have 75% of something missing running the whole universe, according to their calculations. All right? Story's not over yet, all right? Now we got this dark matter to deal with. All right, the principal reason for dark matter is, first of all, it needs to help the dark energy, okay, to ex help accelerate the universe, but that's done talked about too much. The second thing is, you know, they saw uh, in the 70s, Vera Rubin, female astronomer, discovered that the galaxies were rotating too fast for Newton's laws of physics. And let's just throw Einstein's in there. You know, uh, G equals 8 pi uh, mu nu uh, is basically just a recapitulation of Newton's F equals ma, all right? Uh, it's just put in relativistic terms. That's all it is. So these galaxies were defined both Newton's formulas and Einstein's formulas. Okay. So <laughs> you can imagine the consternation this caused in the science community. All right. And why would they be going too fast? Well, in order for F equals MA force equals mass times acceleration to work, you have to have enough M. Okay. To, uh, make the A equal to the F. But there wasn't enough M in the galaxies to create the rate of acceleration that they were rotating. So what do you do? You make it up. You just say it has to be there. Otherwise it wouldn't work. So this extra matter has to be there. But we haven't detected it and we don't know where to find it, and we know it can't be baryonic matter. Now, baryonic matter is matter made of molecules, atoms, proton, protons, neutrons, electrons. At least, at least that's what we think they are. Now, those are the labels we've put on these uh, entities. All right, and then, you know they work pretty well. Uh, but but that and that's baryonic matter. But 
Dark matter, obviously, since it doesn't reflect light and we can't detect it with any other of our, our instruments, it can't be baryonic matter. It has to be some other kind of matter. So here, here's the trick. We'll call it dark matter. As if it really does exist, but it's just dark. You know, dark in the sense that we can't find it yet, but we'll find it someday. All right? So that's where dark matter came from. So, you know, with all these patches to the Big Bang Theory, you know, the, the intelligent person is just going to sit back and say, my, 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 what's going to come next? What other patchwork are we going to have here? And, you know, it just becomes a joke after a while. And, you know, I'm not the only one saying this. I'm just re regurgitating what I've read from the critics, the PhD physicist critics of the Big Bang Theory. Uh, Eric Lerner is one of them. And I quote him ad infinitum in my book. And there's many others, okay? And even the Big Bang theorists know there's a problem. They just don't want to admit it. Why? Well, because that's the only thing they have to hold on to, okay? So that's where it's coming from. Now, geocentrism doesn't need dark energy and dark matter. Why? Well, because you have an Earth in the center, okay? You don't have any explosion that you have to worry about. The Earth got there by divine fiat. And so did the universe. And you can read about that where? Popular science? No. Genesis chapter 1. You can read all about it and see how God put the universe together. He started first with the earth as the foundation stone, so to speak, and then built the whole universe around it. And then he dressed the earth after he was done that. Okay? Now, if you have a central body, which in physics we would call the center of mass, and that's what the earth would be, and then you have this big sphere rotating around it, okay, um, that sphere, first of all, because it's so big and massive, has enough angular momentum that once it started, it will never stop. Okay, that's the glory of the geocentric universe. You know, uh, because to keep the Earth rotating uh, and have it fight against all the internal and external inertial forces that it's going to sustain throughout its life, I think it's not going to keep a 24-hour day. All right, it's going to start slowing down. As they already saw with Venus, they've seen it with Saturn. Uh, you know, uh, the chances of it lasting, you know, more than 100 years is probably pretty slim. But a massive rotating universe with the mass that it has and the speed that it goes, that angular momentum will never cease. Okay, it's inertia, will never cease. So we that's why we can have a 23 hour, 56 minute, 4.1 second day within micron seconds every single day because of the steadiness. It's like a just like a big flywheel, the universe is. Okay. So uh, you don't need any dark energy to keep that going. It's going to go all by itself. All right. Um, you don't need any dark matter uh, because the galaxies basically are controlled by the centrifugal and Coriolis forces that are generated from a, a rotating universe. Okay. This is something that's right beneath the surface of Newtonian physics. Okay. And if you apply Newtonian physics to a uh, Earth in the center with the universe rotating around it, what happens is that the angular momentum of the universe is going to create centrifugal and Coriolis forces. And as the centrifugal forces make things go outward, okay, and backing up, we should say that in the Newtonian system, centrifugal and Coriolis forces are fictitious. They don't know what to do with them, you see. Uh, and, and so they are called artifacts of rotation. But in the 
geocentric frame, the centrifugal and Coriolis forces are real forces created by a real rotating universe with angular momentum. And in that combination, first of all, you have a centrifugal force that makes things go outward, but the, the Coriolis force makes things go inward, okay, at a slight angle, not directly inward, at a slight angle, okay, and it's a curved force, and it's twice as strong as the centrifugal force, okay? You can find this on Wikipedia. So if that's the case, what's going to happen? Well, the combination of the centrifugal force going out and the uh, Coriolis force going on an angle, angle inward is going to cause a net centripetal force, and it's going to keep all those stars, all those planets in their courses, and it's going to have a residual Coriolis force on the galaxies that are already rotating. And that's where they're going to get their speed from, okay? So, of course, they're going to rotate faster with not enough matter for F equals MA because they're not gone by F equals MA. They're going by the energy that's created by the rotating universe, you see. So geocentrism has an explanation for why these things uh, are, are going faster than F equals MA will allow. See, because F, F equals MA doesn't deal with centrifugal and Coriolis forces. It considers them artifacts. And yet when they send satellites up, they have to add in centrifugal and Coriolis forces to F equals MA in order to get those satellites to go where they need to go. That should tell them something. That should tell them that Newton's system doesn't work, you see. And the only other way it can work is if you switch places now, and instead of having the Earth rotate and the universe stand still, you have the universe rotate and the Earth stand still. Then it'll work, you see. And that's the glory of geocentrism. And, of course, you know, you don't need inflation. You don't need dark energy. You don't need dark matter, okay? You will have superluminal speeds, okay? Because as that universe rotates, the farther the radii from the Earth, the faster that uh, universe is going to rotate, okay? So that answers the question of why we don't have to depend on light speed at 186,000 miles per second. On the surface of the Earth, yeah, that's where it would be that speed, but not out in outer space because you have centrifugal and gravitational forces that allow that, that light speed to go superluminal, as well as the planets and the stars that go around us every day. And they can't argue against this because Einstein's general relativity is where we got it from, okay? He's the one that says that... Uh, the speed of light outside that caused by gravitational and centrifugal forces is going to be superluminal. He's the one that said objects out in that, a deep space under those same forces can go superluminal. Okay? So we're just repeating what he said. We're just applying what he said. All right? So geocentrism is no fly-by-night scientific ideology that comes from the Bible, you know. Yeah, it comes from the Bible, but there's a reason the Bible says it's because it's the truth. All right? And it's really the only way things are going to work. If you want to explain the Big Bang and explain inflation, dark energy, dark superluminal speed, all that kind of stuff, be my guest. Okay? Uh, you're going to end up uh, the same place these people have ended up. And that's scratching their heads, waiting for the next answer to come along. All right? So I have gone 15 minutes over time. I hope that helps you, Victor. Oh, no, it's not, wasn't Victor. Who was that? Larry. Uh, thanks for the question, Larry. You let me get on my soapbox and uh, explain something I wanted to say for a long time. Victor had one more question I might tackle. I don't know. Uh, once Krauss said that space can expand at any speed faster than C. Oh, glad he said thank you, Victor. If you know where he said that, could you send that to me, please? I, I'd like to quote him. I, I am sincere about that, Victor. Please send that to me. Get the quote, get the reference, send it to me, please, as soon as you can. Uh, the limitation of the speed C would only be applied to things inside space, but not to space itself. 
Uh, what does that mean, Victor? First of all, you're going to need to define what space is. Okay. And this is the problem for them. This is why um, Einstein changed his mind about no ether. Okay. In the special theory, he said there wasn't an ether. And he needed to say that because if he said there was an ether, it means that something could affect the speed of light. So he took away the ether so that the light speed wouldn't be affected. So it would always be constant. In general relativity, he took the ether back and said that the ether was the medium for light. Well, if that's the case, then the ether can affect the speed of light. Because if you have forces in the ether that are different in point A than point B, obviously, that medium is going to change. And so it's going to affect the thing that's traveling through it. That makes sense. Okay. So uh, that's the problem with Einstein's theory, okay? Most people don't know this, and then they don't teach this in college, in universities. They skip right over this stuff. And, you know, you have to dig pretty deep to find this stuff, all right? But that's the case. So that's what you have to do. And so with space, how do you define space? Are you going to say it's empty? Well, what does that mean? Are you going to say it's nothing? Space is nothing. There's nothing out there. Well, what does that mean? Nothing, by definition, means that it doesn't exist. Okay? So that means there's nothing between point A and point B. All right? If that were the case, then point A and point B would coalesce because there's nothing between them. If you're going to go by the strict definition of nothing. In other words, the Earth and the Moon would coalesce into one object if there was no, if there was nothing between them. All right. So there must be something between the Earth and the Moon. Okay. What is that something? We call it space, but that means space is an entity. Space is something, not a nothing. But what's that something made of? All right. Well, here again is where. You know, Einstein's special relativity conf conflicts with quantum mechanics. Because quantum mechanics says that, um, that there is a something in space. Space is a something. It's made of something. We call it space because we can't see it. Just like we call the air in this room, we call it space, but it's actually molecules of oxygen, nitrogen, argon, carbon dioxide, all, you know, mingling with one another. So there's something in this space that I call my office, okay? But what quantum mechanics is saying, there's something a lot smaller than oxygen molecules, nitrogen molecules, argon and carbon dioxide. Very, very small. And that's what we call space, okay? So um, now if, if light has to travel through that, and light is going to be, uh, that's, let's say it's, um, let's say it's uh, a million miles from the Earth. At that radii in a rotating universe, you're going to have some tremendous uh, inertial forces on that light beam. And if so, it's going to travel a lot faster than it would on the Earth, you see. And what this does for the geocentrists is it solves the starlight problem of Genesis chapter 1. Because, you know, you'll hear this complaint forever from our critics saying, well, you know, it says God made the stars on the fourth day, but how are these stars uh, going to give light on the earth if they're so far away and light can only travel at 186,000 miles a second? It's going to take millions of years for that light to reach the earth. So you see what they do. They use Einstein's special theory of relativity that has the limitation on the speed of light. And they say, well, that starlight couldn't reach, uh, you know, Earth in, in one day. All right. And that same general relativity that they use for space expansion or universe expansion. Well, they don't add that in there. And some of them wouldn't even add it in there because they don't even know it that Einstein's general relativity allowed light to go any speed, okay? 
But if we do, uh, you know, the geocentric theory is the only one that fits. Because the farther that star is from the Earth, the faster its light is going to come to the Earth. And it could get here in a matter of minutes. Okay? And we also have the same principle with gravity. If space is a something, and that something interacts with itself, it could transmit gravity in a split second. Split second. My books uh, give the calculations to that. Depending on how small the entities are that make up space, uh, the light beam could travel through it. In a, uh, I mean, the, the gravitational longitudinal wave could travel through it in a split second. As a matter of fact, the calculations show that from one end of the universe to the other, it would take 10 to the minus 44 seconds for gravity to travel. That's how fast it is. And other scientists see, yeah, well, that makes sense. Because if gravity traveled as slow as the speed of light and special relativity, everything would fall apart. Okay? Tom Van, Van Flander was uh, the one who made that popular. He died a few years ago. Uh, not a Christian, secular scientist. Um, but, you know, that is a, a fact. So, you know, everything works in a geocentric universe. That's why I love it so much. Scientifically, it's like a puzzle. You just, every piece fits together. And it answers all the anomalies that the Big Bang theorists are having now with their theories. Okay, so there you have it. That will be the end of our program. I went over about 25 minutes today, but it was enjoyable. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'll look forward to seeing you next week. Same time, same channel. 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. next Thursday. Look forward to having you. Bring your questions. Prepare them. I'll be glad to answer them as best I can. Thanks for being with me tonight, and I want to sign off. God bless you.